Hello everyone and uh, welcome to our event this evening, uh, which is translating Edna O'Brien's Girl. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I'll hand over to uh, the Ambassador, um, His Excellency Stefan Cruza. Well, thank you so much. Delighted to be here for this uh, special event for the European Day of Languages, which is a uh, day uh, to celebrate the diversity of languages spoken across Europe and encourage lifelong learning. Uh, so today's event is organized by the Trinity Center for Literary and Cultural Translation in partnership with UNIC Island Cluster. Uh, the UNIC is co-chaired uh, this year in 2020 by the French Embassy and the Alliance Française in Dublin. So thank you uh, uh, to all, uh, particularly uh, Dr. Jingli at Trinity and to all our partners at UNIC Ireland. So what is UNIC? Um, well, it's the European Union National Institutes for Culture. Uh, it's a, it's uh, supported by the, the European Commission. And uh, UNIC members work in many areas, including the arts, uh, youth, education, and at a local level, uh, UNIC members join in, uh, in some hundred clusters around the world, in cities, in regions, in countries. And in uh, Ireland, UNIC has been active since 2009. And uh, some 11 countries have joined uh, this, uh, this group. And its main purpose is to promote cultural diversity and linguistic diversity and understanding between European societies. So we have five countries uh, today that are participating in this uh, very special literary event. Uh, Italy, Spain, Germany, Ireland, of course, and France, of course. Uh, so we're all very grateful to our, to our partners for having joined in this, uh, this event on translating Edna O'Brien's book, Girl, uh, Edna O'Brien, who you may remember, uh, is a friend of uh, ambassadors because she got the, she won the Prix des Ambassadeurs Francophones back in 2017 for her book, The Little Red Chairs. Uh, so we're absolutely delighted to, uh, to have uh, Edna O'Brien with us again today. Um, uh, so thank you again. Thank you again for, for joining, for, for participating and uh, give you the phone back. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That's perfect. OK, so uh, the next thing I'm going to share my screen, which and we will be able to listen to Edna O'Brien um, welcoming you to this event. Hello, and I wish I were with you all, but I think you know the reason why I can't be. I want to say a few words about translation, what Walter Benjamin called the task of translation and its special mission. He said it involved a kinship with the original without being subordinate to it. He also said that along with conveying the story without distortion, but there was something even more important to get to the core, the mysterious, the poetic, and the pulse within, so that the translated work becomes a renewed flower. Translator and writer will have had a secret affinity, not unlike a marriage in its shifting manifestations, love, solidarity, irritation, and so on. I was also very intrigued to learn that Dr. Johnson's first published prose work was actually a translation by a Jesuit priest Lobo called A Voyage to Abyssinia. Boswell called it a union of force, vivacity, and perspicuity, which no doubt it was. But Johnson said something extra and enlightening. He determined to fit the translation and the language as well into the very mold and the very thinking of the original writer. 
to stifle his egotism in order to convey the gifts of the other. It was creativity in another way, as if writer and translator had become interchanging embryos. No wonder translation is called a noble act, because it is. The translator gets not only inside that narrative and the rhythms of the original, but something more subliminal happens. The governing power of the bewitchment which the book intended to be. Our cultural world today and for centuries would be a cul-de-sac without translation. I think in my own case how impoverished I would be if Constance Garnet a brave Englishwoman had not taught herself Russian so as to translate all of Chekhov's stories, many of Tolstoy, and some of Dostoevsky. I don't speak Russian, but when I compare her with more modern translators of the very self-same stories, I feel she was truer in some ineluctable way, truer to the, to the original. Others cannot help but impose flashy, modern, unwelcome linguistic effects. She did something other. She went inside the work and lived it as though it were her own. And that for me is probably one of the big challenges of translation and which makes it ultimately not a duty but a creative excitement of its own. To my many translators, I want to say a big thank you. And I want to reaffirm my debt to you, which is ongoing, I hope. Some of you I have met, including Pierre Emmanuel Dozat, Aude de saint loup whom I brilliant publisher Sabine Westpacier recognized as being the ideal marriage or marriages for me. And also Giovanna Granato, who has translated my novels beautifully for Einaudi in Italy. There are others that I have not met in Greece, Holland, Turkey, Spain, Portugal, Sweden, Iceland, Bulgaria, and one or two more that I'm hoping for. It means so much to me to have strangers in other places read a book or a short story of mine. It also means a great deal to me that I can read writers, ancient and modern, from all over the world. I can teach myself because writer and translator never cease doing that. Lastly, I want to mention publishers. They are to be thanked for the, they are to be ongoingly thanked for their efforts and their expenditure, because it is costly, in bringing worlds together, not through war or pillage, but through the elixir of literature that binds countries and peoples together. I am now going to read a short extract from Girl. The book is told in the first person by the Nigerian girl. And this is a moment in the forest where she is alone with her baby. She has escaped the clutches and the horror of Boko Haram. And she is in the forest trying to make her way back to sanity and to a home. There is only Babby and me now. She cries from the pit of her empty belly, hoarse, savage cries. And I say to her, you have no name and no father. I bark at her. Sometimes I want to kill her. My breasts are the size of egg cups 
and she is tugging at the nipples, tugging as if she too wants to kill me. We search for a well because the water in the ditches is brown and muddy and tastes foul. We drink the clear water in the cavity of the big rocks. I cup my hands in it and she laps it up eagerly, swallows it as if she might choke. Those are our moments of grace. Fresh water, fresh water, and a little reprieve from thirst and hopelessness. I have no notion of what day it is, or what month, or what year. All I know is that the air is scudded with sand, sand blowing in from the Sahel that scrapes our eyes and half blinds us. Where there are no trees, the earth is an ochre yellow, scored with deep zigzag lines. Quite a picture. And the young curled leaves are starting to sprout on the tips of the branches. In the night, when I lie awake, as I do, I see sky, sky, a vast violet expanse of it in this land of beauty that has become a place of woe. So many dead girls, the sad soughing of the trees. I lay her down with her head pillowed on a bit of raised turf. It is the only time she sleeps. I sleep in snatches for where I sleep in snatches for fear of what might befall us. Sometimes I wake in a dream with wet eyelids, a dream of a person I must have known, or maybe even loved. But this is not the time for either memory or pathos. Occasionally I hear the barking of dogs in the distance, and I have not sighted a single human being in days. I fear that if I do, we will be dragged back for the bloodiest end. I am unable to pray in my own tongue. As they bombarded us with their prayers, their edicts, their ideology, their hatred, their godliness. So on a happier note, I thank you all again and say slauncher and have a wonderful evening. Well thank you very much James and welcome everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here this evening and while I'm very sorry that we're not all in the same room, um, I'm also very grateful to the technology which is bringing us together in many different places. Um, it's obviously a great privilege to have begun this event by hearing Edna O'Brien read from her remarkable novel Girl um, for those of you who haven't yet read it, I promise we'll try not to give too much away um, in, the, uh, in the discussion, but at the same time, we do have this unique opportunity to step inside the novel by speaking to people who've, who've lived very intimately with it and translated it. Uh, so that's very exciting for, for all of us. Um, Girl has received uh, many accolades, um, and of those, I think it's particularly valuable to, to mention one. Um, it was shortlisted in the UK for the Orwell Prize for Political Fiction in 2020. And I think that really is a very important measure of the significance of this uh, novel, um, uh, you know, as a political uh, 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 reflection of and engagement with um, a very contemporary um, uh, situation. Um, the Orwell Prize judging panel praised Edna O'Brien's uh, meticulous research and also her clear respect for her characters in this novel. Um, as she exposes what the, what, what the panel described as the, the far-reaching consequences of one of the most heinous weapons of war, violence and, and abuse uh, of women. Um, I think another important theme of the novel, and certainly the one that we'll be dwelling on this evening, is language. Um, the environments of this novel are frequently multilingual, um, and as Edna O'Brien herself has just explained, this is a first person narrative. So Girl is very much concerned with memory and also importantly, it's concerned with the language that we put onto experience. 
Now, for the narrator of this novel, the experiences she undergoes are very often unspeakably uh, distressing. Um, but this theme, I think, is uh, distilled very interestingly um, in a brief observation the narrator makes about her infant daughter towards the end of the novel, um, where she says uh, of her daughter, she did not know words, but she knew terror. That's quite a, a, desolate, a desolating statement, I suppose, but it's an important uh, starting point, I think, for our conversation this evening about language and words and indeed the expression and representation of terror um, in Edna O'Brien's Girl. So I'm absolutely delighted now to introduce our guests. Um, first of all, Katrin Razum, who is joining us this evening from Heidelberg and has translated Girl into German, as does Machen. Giovanna Granato, who is joining us from Nani and has translated the novel into Italian as La Gazza. Anna Matabuil, who joins us from Barcelona and has translated Girl into Spanish as La Chica. And from Paris, uh, the publisher Sabine Vespiza, who is speaking on behalf of the novel's French translators, Aude de Saint-Luc and Pierre-Emmanuel Doza. Um, unfortunately, they can't be with us this evening, but we send them our very best wishes. And we're delighted to have Sabine here in their place. Um, I'd also like to thank and welcome uh, from Canada, Danielle Leblanc, who is a PhD student in the Centre for Literary and Cultural Translation and has provided interpretation assistance uh, this evening. So um, to begin our conversation, um, I'd like to turn to uh, Sabine, um, first of all, um, with a question about the title of this uh, novel. Um, very interestingly, uh, Pierre Emmanuel and Aude chose not to translate the title of Girl into French. Uh, so the French edition of Girl, like the English edition, is called Girl. And uh, Sabine, I wondered if you could comment on that decision of the translators. Good evening, everybody. So I, um, just to say that Pierre Emmanuel and uh, Aude de saint loup are very sorry not to be able with that. To be not to be able to be with us to, tonight. Pierre Emmanuel is a historical translator of Edna O'Brien. He almost translated all his works, and uh, Aude, uh, his wife, joined him uh, in 2013 for Country Girl, and since then, then they work together. So, of course, uh, we'll read their answers tonight. Uh, they were uh, fortunately able to send me something, and thank you to Daniel for the translation. So Pierre Emmanuel is speaking now. Girl couldn't be translated into French as anything other than girl. Our approach is inspired by the concept of no traduction, as it was called by Quebecois poet and translator Jacques Brou. It was the best way to remain faithful to the spirit of the text, if not to the world itself. Fee would have been a mistranslation or would have been counterintuitive because of the polysemic nature of the word fee in French. It means girl and daughter, but also whore. And when it's used without a compliment or clarification, girl is a bargaining chip that that allows for the erasure of a figure. And Aude de saint Lou adds, apart from the fact that Phi was used for the title of a recently released book in France by Camille Laurence, the word does not have the same resonance in both languages. Keeping it in English seemed to preserve the tone and, and to give a broader meaning perhaps making it seem less impulsive, even pejorative, than what we can hear in French when the term is not related to family. Thank you very much, Sabine. Um, Anna, I wonder, if, I wonder if I could ask you the same question. Um, you did translate the title, and I wonder, I wonder how, you, how you made that decision. Um. Hello, everybody, and thank you for being here with us. Uh, well, actually, I didn't think of not translating it, <laughs> for instance. No. Um, our question was whether girl, first, well, we had two main questions here. One of them was whether girl should be chica or niña, which could, could be used in different contexts. 
uh, especially because the novel stars, um, I was a girl once, but not anymore. So when I first uh, read that, first I thought of Niña. Era una niña, fui una niña, ya no lo soy, but mean I lost my innocence in Spanish. I'm no longer a little girl, which is also, in a sense, what happens to her, uh, brutally. But then uh, we thought, um, when we say, fui una chica, pero ya no lo soy, also means it's a dehumanization, dehumanization of herself. Like, I'm no longer a human being. I'm no longer even a girl. So uh, we decided for this una chica in the beginning of the, of the book, y la chica in the title, which would be a little bit like giving her back this humanity. So she's la chica in the title, which was the second issue, whether uh, we could or not is la, una, nothing. Chica wouldn't have worked in Spanish, I think. Uh, it would be a bit lost. So we decided on la chica. And also we had other novels by her, like las chicas de campo, um, other like la chica de ojos verdes, chica. So we had some some other chicas translated for her, girls. So that would give her like um, a unity as well. Thank you, Anna. And yeah, it's important, I think, to be reminded that girl is is kind of a key word in, in Edna O'Brien's um, oeuvre. Um, Giovanna, could, could I ask the same question to you? And, and how did you uh, approach the title of, of the novel as you were translating it? Um, it's more or less the same as Anna said. Uh, it's a very evocative word. We translated uh, the previous uh, books by Anne O'Brien using ragazza, la ragazza, la ragazza di campagna, uh, ragazza di campagna, and so on. Uh, and we also decided, uh, this is the Italian edition, I don't know if you can see it, uh, we, we also decided not to use the article because the text uh, is so essential, the language in the text is so essential, so, so terse, uh, so um, simple in a way, uh, that we, we thought that ragazza was an absolute, uh, we liked it, uh, that's why we chose Thank you. Thank you very much, Giovanna. And, and Catherine, um, finally, um, could I ask the same question to you, um, how you approach the title? Um, there was really not much choice in German. Um, it was pretty clear that girl had to be Mädchen. The only question that I discussed with my editor was, um, should it be das Mädchen or simply Mädchen? So should we add uh, the article or not? But then in German, if, if we put Mädchen without an article, it could be plural as well. So that was sort of uh, unclear. And because of that, we decided to, to add the article. Although I would have preferred to, to just have the, this one word. But um, for grammatical reasons, it wasn't really possible. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much. Well, I think those answers already take us towards um, I guess some characteristics or in fact even the texture of, of the of the prose of this novel Giovanna talked about its um, terseness and its um, its simplicity in a way um, I'd like to turn to a grammatical feature of the novel um, throughout there's a kind of frequent switching between the present tense and the past tense so just to give a very brief example uh, a sentence from quite near the beginning of the novel um, the narrator is in this Boko Haram camp to which she's been abducted and she's watching uh, men um, approach uh, the girls. She says, then I saw four men cross the yard. He was the most noticeable, eel thin and cocky and wore a jazzy shirt. The music from their phones is belting. So that's just a very brief example of how the narrator um, switches and switches us, I think, between the, you know, what she's recollecting and then all of a sudden we're immersed in the present moment. Um, I wonder if that presented uh, any issues to you as you were translating and, and if you followed and observed that, that switch. Um, Anna, perhaps, perhaps I could start with you with this question, please. Um, well, it's, a, it's an important question. As you say, style is really, it's really uh, shocking sometimes when she changes from one tense into the other. So um, we saw that it was necessary to keep a change, to keep in, in the sense of uh, some um, scenes are first narrated in the past and they switch back into the present. But what we thought 
could also be a bit misleading for our audience was like uh, mixing too much inside the same paragraph. You see that sometimes when we translate and when we edit a text, we, we find, you know, we some middle way. So we, we kept these changes, but sometimes when there was only a sentence in between in one tense and then came back to the other, then we maybe kept the whole paragraph in the past and then we switch back, which also gives it force because it's like a sudden change. In the in the case you just read, if I'm allowed to read it, uh, if you would like to, um, you will see we kept the first paragraph in the past, but then when the boy comes, then it's totally present tense for her. Entonces vi a cuatro hombres que cruzaban el patio. Uno de ellos destacaba sobre el resto, delgado como una anguila y con aspecto de gallito. Llevaba una camisa chillona. Habían puesto la música del móvil a tope. De repente se levanta, perdón, si de repente se adelanta corriendo y me tira al suelo. Me quita la hilo que me envuelve y pide por señas a los otros que hagan fotos con el móvil. Y entonces ocurre el chasquido de su bragueta, el calor de su aliento cuando me penetra al ritmo de la música. And so on. So as you can see, it's really, well, it's really straightforward. So we need her to be in the present. And, and just really briefly, what Edna Ryan just read, for instance, was also a, a good example of this present tense for her when she says, Ahora solo estamos, Babi y yo, llora desde el pozo de su estómago vacío, unos roncos chillidos salvajes. Y yo le digo, no tienes nombre ni padre, le grito como una fiera. So I think in those scenes, present obviously gives like an immediate, immediacy that she is feeling. So we thought it was important to keep it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Anna. That, that's great. Um, Giovanna, uh, how did you approach this, um, this tense change throughout the novel? Uh, yes, this is the fourth book by Edna O'Brien uh, that I have translated. So I am accustomed uh, with uh, her style. And uh, this continuous switch between uh, uh, past and present uh, is something like a, a signature style, you know. Um, I, uh, the little red chairs, for instance, uh, uh, begins at the present. Uh, there is a prologue at the present. And then immediate, immediately, as soon as the, the narrative begins, uh, it goes back to the past and then switches to the present continuously. And uh, while the December, for instance, which is another book I translated, I, I opened it at random and I saw that uh, um, there was a switch there too. And this is a book uh, written in 1999. So it, it, it's, I mean, it's something that belongs to her. So I respect uh, it totally and completely, even if it's uh, um, a bit alienating sometimes uh, when you read it. Uh, but um, I mean, it's her. It's a, her way of writing, and also her way of uh, um, talking. Uh, I saw before this uh, our uh, this meeting uh, today. I saw the BBC documentary uh, on her um, the, um, done last year, um, and towards the end of the documentary, uh, she's talking about girl. Um, and she talks about uh, a very difficult moment. Uh, well, she was at, at the airport uh, and she had lots of money uh, on her, uh, hidden in uh, her underwear and in her sleeves and so on. Uh, and when she talks about this very difficult moment, she immediately talking, uh, switches to the present. Uh, and I think this speaks volume. I mean, it's her. Um, and even if it's strange, and even if, uh, as I said, uh, you have to, um, then you have revisers, you have editors, and so on, and they try to normalize uh, because the, it can be strange for the reader. But anyway, um, we, we know her, and we have all the maximum respect for her style, and so we we, we try to respect it every time. Uh, every switch respected, more or less, I hope. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. I, I think she does actually the same sort of thing in the acknowledgements for the book where she's uh, talking about the research she undertook and, and recalling the time she spent in Nigeria. Uh, and then all of a sudden she goes into the into the present tense there. Even remember 
they're doing something similar in The Country Girls, her first novel, a couple of interventions in the present tense. So interesting definitely to think about this as a, as a signature um, uh, of, of the style, absolutely. Um, Catherine, could I ask you the same question, please? Um, there's really not much left to say for me because my colleagues said it all. <laughs> um, we we do the same thing, or my editor and I decided to do the same thing, keep the, um, the, the very abrupt changes between the tenses. Um, mostly, I, I should say, there, there were very, very few um, places in the text where we decided to, um, like, use the past tense for one sentence longer than it was in the original and then make the switch but very few um, places I should say um, basically I agree that it's a it's a very typical feature of Edna O'Brien's work and it needs to be kept I mean we, we can't simply turn it into we don't want to turn it into a regular text that's that just reads like any average novel I mean it's it's just a it's supposed to be uh, sort of. Um, it's supposed to make you stop and and wonder, and uh, I think we need to keep that really. Great, thank you so much. And uh, Sabine, finally, um, uh, did Pierre Manuel and Aude have have a similar approach? It's a little oh. bit different in French. This uh, shift in tense mm -hmm. have been done oh. here. French readers, at least since 1897, with uh, um, Edouard Dujardin's Les Lauriers sont coupés, and Proust, Gide, and many other writers have accustomed us to this as well, as has Valérie Larbeau, uh, the French tr translator of James Joyce. So this mixing of temporalities is very classic in French and creates a, ch a change of rhythm that feels completely natural. So the answer is the same for the acknowledgements. Uh, they were duly respected, the, 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 um, the shifts of tense were duly respected. And Pierre Emmanuel adds that, uh, I would also say that we, we would have respected these shifts, even if we had needed to break, break grammar rules in French to respect them. But that was not the case. Brilliant. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I guess a slightly different feature of, of the novel um, now. Um, sort of around halfway through, the, the main character is taken to a, a military post um, sort of as part of her um, the process of her escape. Um, and she meets there a commander, a military commander, who has a fascination with Charles Dickens. And Brian makes this decision to include quite a long passage from Great Expectations um, in the novel, um, which the, the commander reads aloud to the, um, to the main character. And I was very interested to, to hear how you approach that in your in your translations. Um, Catherine, I wonder if we could start with you. Um, did you include an extract from a, another translation, or, or did you translate that passage from Great Expectations yourself? Well, what I usually do when when there's a quote of some other book in a text that I translate is uh, look for a, sort of the canonic um, translation, if there is one, and use that. So that's what I try to do in this case, too. But um, as my colleagues will know, this was not that easy because um, after I checked like three or four different translations of, of Dickens um, that were available, I realized that this particular passage is not in the book that's published in Germany anyway. So I, I did some research and I found out that this was actually um, taken from a, um, an early version of the book that was not published in book form at the time, but in, in installments in a newspaper. So uh, <laughs> it took a lot of time for me to find that out. And then, of course, there was no um, German translation of that particular uh, uh, early form of the novel. So I translated it myself. I, I read a little bit in um, other older um, Dickens translations just to get into the tone. And then I did it myself. Thank you. That's that's really interesting. I went on that same Dickens um, quest actually when I read this passage. I believe it's an alternative ending for for Great Expectations or something that's a, right. 
very, very interesting. Thank you. And um, Sabine, was it the same for, for Pierre Emmanuel and Aude? Um, no, this, this novel by, by Dickens has, was translated in France by one of the great masters of translation, Pierre Léris. The quoted excerpt was perfect. And uh, so um, Pierre Emmanuel says, uh, we did not think it necessary to retranslate it or even to modify it, which we could have done without difficulty had we judged it necessary. And uh, we acknowledge our debt, as we do for the quotes from the King James Version, whose French equivalents are much more difficult to find. In this case, uh, we use, they use the Second Bible. Brilliant. Thank you. Reminding us there of the, the kind of the illusions that Agrines is drawing in. Um, Anna, how did you approach the, the Dickens extract? Here I am again. <laughs> um, well, as, as Catherine was saying, it wasn't as easy as it seemed. Like at the beginning, you say, okay, I'll, I'll go for Grandes Esperanzas and then I'll find it and then you don't find it and so on. But uh, fortunately, uh, among the different translations we have in Spanish, I did find uh, one. And I think there are two of them at least that have uh, translated this um, alternative ending. Uh, so what I did is I, I took the one by published by Galaxia Gutenberg, uh, Circulo de Lectores, which was published in 2012. But the funny thing was, the main translation on, of the book was by Manuel Valde, which was actually one of the first translators of the book. But obviously, he didn't translate this alternative ending that was found later on, although he, he wrote it earlier. Uh, so the ending of the book was by Francesc Esparza, right? was translated by Francesc Esparza. So and I think the funny thing, but because if you find if you look for the bibliography of this book, you will only find the first name of the translator. But as a translator myself, I was like, I cannot quote this Francesc Esparza Pages and then you know not say. It. So what I did was I, I I quoted this part, then in the footnote I added that well the the this I added that it was part of this alternative ending found afterwards. So that you know, a bit of a, you know, a memorial <laughs> or something. Um, I, I know this was like giving more information to the, to our readers than they had in English, but I think we sometimes do this. And I, I thought it was interesting enough because what I say, I say was, it was a darker ending. And I think this is important because, well, when you read the book, uh, you will find that it has plenty of hopeful things, but not all of them are. And this ending also keeps this not so hopeful, um, you know, um, ending for the book. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Um, and Giovanna, how about you um, and Dickens? Yes, I totally agree with these uh, things that Anna was saying uh, about this uh, ending that is not at all happy. Uh, they are not living happily ever after. Uh, maybe that's why Edna chooses this, uh, this ending. Um, it is customary for an Audi uh, to use uh, uh, an Audi translation if it exists. And uh, we have a translation of great expectations uh, done by Maria Luisa Certosio de Courten. I had to write the name because it's so long. Um, and uh, uh, but it was the other one, uh, so I decided to do it because uh, Dickens is one of my favorite authors, uh, and when I read him, I feel like a girl going on the merry-go-round and translating it. Him was even better, so uh, I did it myself. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I suppose I want to just to draw attention to a, um, a particular page in the novel, which anyone who's read it will um, remember. Um, again, it's reminding us that the novel is, is multilingual um, in, in various ways. And I hope that you can see it if I hold it up to my, um, to my uh, screen here. Um, so this is towards the very end of the novel. Um, O'Brien makes this decision to do a kind of Tristram Shandy-esque break with the conventions of the page. And she just has this single word, dawa 
um, an Arabic word, the, the, uh, the call to Islam or the, or the Islamic mission um, being evoked here. And she just obviously allows it to break free of the of the narrative and, and represents it across the page. I mean, I wonder, um, did you leave that intact as you were translating it? Um, uh, Sabine, um, could, you, could you explain how Pierre Manuel and, and Ford handled that page? They, they, they left it, as you can see. So um, here too, they had a, a strategy with a no traduction. The world may marks a break to the, that page layout, also, and the layout also highlights it. Uh, they say we could have translated the world literally with invitation or maybe désordre um, to link with the dreamlike carnage that precedes it or the trackless bushes falling into one another that come after. But this would have been completely erased the shock produced by the use of different idioms. Not translating it, says Pierre Emmanuel, conveys the, the call to non-Muslims to listen to the message of Islam like no translation could. And Benjamin Adorno and Spitzer uh, taught us not to chase away foreign words under the pretext of translation. Girl Dawa reminds the readers that much work remains to be done or not done. In a humanities text, a translator's note would have been justified, but not in this case. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Anna, um, how did you handle this, this page? Um, well, it's no surprise we also kept it. But uh, what I was I was um, investigating a little bit this word because I uh, well one of the meanings of Dawa is like proselytizing of Islam, but also in Yoruba one of the things I found uh, means something like alone or lonely, uh, which is quite interesting because it's like well I don't know if I can say much of the book but it's one of the tough moments for her when when she doesn't know about her little girl and stuff so. If we get like the image of the page being like totally out of control and herself feeling totally desperate, I think that this meaning is also there. But the interesting thing is I also found that it can mean moon or month in Tibetan and Sherpa culture, which is obviously not the case here, but curiously enough, our our uh, cover in Spanish has got a full moon, which and the moon is also playing a part in the book like the moon that accompanies her in some of the places. So I think um, we, we, didn't, we didn't use a footnote here either, but I d I'm not even sure which one of all these meanings, or, or even if all of them were, were in, inside. So I wouldn't venture to translate it. Brilliant, thank you. And again, reminding us of these kind of layers of reference that O'Brien is, is allowing us to, um, to, to draw on. And Giovanna, how about, how about you? Um, here's the page. <laughs> it remains the same, of course. Uh, this made me think that uh, uh, this, this book was born as a translated book. Uh, because during her researches, Edna had to talk with foreign people and uh, someone had to translate for her what the girl said. And she had to translate uh, it into English and then into literature. Uh, but apart from the other things that uh, Anna in, and uh, Sabine said, uh, um, uh, the book is uh, studied uh, with uh, words in uh, Nigerian pidgin. Uh, there are many of them. And the thing is that all of them are, are translated uh, by Edna. Um, I have a list here. There is uh, Dabino Dabi, for instance, uh, which means date. Uh, or there is also Dawo instead of Dawa, that is translated as uh, come back, come back. A every time she uses uh, uh, Nigerian words, uh, they are translated. Well, then there is this dawa that breaks in the page and uh, folds on itself uh, and is not translated. Uh, so I, I too had uh, to, to make research and discover that uh, is uh, 
um, uh, the, the invitation uh, to a non-Muslim to convert uh, to Islam, uh, and I think it's it's important. Uh, uh, it, it was obviously fundamental to to leave it the way it is uh, and to leave it not translated. Thank you, and and Catherine, I think I may be able to guess the answer, but um, but I wonder how you how you handled this. <laughs> Well, same thing, of course. <laughs> There's really no way this could have been translated, I think. Um, it's it, it's supposed to be unfamiliar to readers in, in the original, so we have to keep it unfamiliar to readers in our language. So that's, that's really, um, I think it would have been irresponsible to translate it even. I mean, it, it would have changed everything. As you can see here, if you can see it, it looks a bit different in the German uh, can you see it in the German edition? Unfortunately, um, this this uh, this particular word and the particular shape in which it is printed in the original uh, has not been kept. It, it shares the page with like ten lines of text, which is too bad. <laughs> I, I would have preferred it to cover a whole page as it does in the original, but I suppose this was. Um, decided for layout reasons. It, it, um, if I turn the page, there's a blank page and then the next chapter starts. So I think it would have um, made things a little complicated. But then it's a compromise and I, I wish they had decided to print it on a whole page <laughs> to can see you. I mean, it, it, it makes a difference. It, it's, it's more, um, it just seems to be more impressive if it covers a whole page. But anyway, that's not up to me to decide. <laughs> it, still, it still looks very impressive. I think we get that. We get the effect of it very much. Um, yeah, I'm um, I'm conscious of time, and I'm keen to get to some of the questions that members of the audience have been posting in the chat. And in fact, somebody has asked a question that. I was very keen to hear you all answer as well. So I might switch to, to the chat now. Um, we have a question here um, which uh, is asking you, um, given the, the, the nature of the novel, given the fact that the novel deals with sexual violence and is a very kind of immediate and intimate um, first person narration, um, how did you cope with having to return to this subject over and over again in your in your drafting as you as you translated the novel. Catherine, maybe I could ask you that um, first of all. Yes, um, it was a very, very hard book to translate for this particular reason. I found it um, at times I, I had to stop work because it was it was so oppressive and so so intense and I had to take a break um, because of course I did a lot of research on the side and and looked at videos at um, well um, news videos or interviews with girls who had been abducted and and um, reappeared and um, it was really really hard and <laughs> um, I kept thinking I mean of course the, the it's it's sort of absurd because I sit at my desk in Germany and I'm safe and I'm you know I do my work and I get paid for it and I think it's oh this is so terrible and I really suffer while I'm doing this work but the person who really suffers of course is um girl right and all the other girls that are that that, that she stands for and it's a very weird situation and I kept thinking of what it must have been uh, for Edna O'Brien, because of course it was much more intense for her. But, you know, every single word you write is sort of takes you into the experience, and um, uh, yeah, I I can only say that you know translation is all about entering a different world and and sort of becoming the speaker in this case, and it it gets very close to me and um, it's it's one of the reasons why I love translating because it's a it's a very um, it's a very intuitive and and uh, very intense uh, kind of work but it gets to you also I mean it's it's uh, yeah 
it's it's uh, you pay for it in a way. I I can imagine that. Um, uh, Giovanna, did, did you have a similar experience? With, you know, was it was it very difficult to translate this novel based on you know? Um, uh, it, it was a bit different. I mean, I was very, very moved by the book twice. The first time I read it, uh, and yesterday when I read it again for this meeting, uh, while working at the book, um, because as Catherine said, you are in, in, a, in, in a particular territory as a translator, which is uh, almost between the reader and the writer, maybe nearer to the writer. Um, but I was struggling with someone else. Uh, I was struggling with words. I was struggling with adjectives, uh, commas. Uh, I was struggling with this language, uh, which is so, um, it, 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 I, I don't know if the others had the, the same impression, but when you read this book, it's like reading a Greek tragedy. Uh, nothing is unnecessary. Um, Edna is a, a surgeon, I mean, just a cut and the, the, the best bleeding possible. Um, and you have to, um, you, you have to fight with this language to keep it simple, but not low. Um, uh, I don't know how to say, not, not, not to lapse into cheap, into a cheap language. So it has to be like literature, but it has to be straight, terse, as I said before. So this was my problem while I translated the book. And the story was something else. I mean, there it was language. The story was when I read it yesterday uh, and, and I was totally moved because she, she, there, there's such a strength in, uh, in this language. The story is said in, in, in such a simple way, it, it's so di 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 direct, uh, it arrives, bam, like a punch, you know. Uh, so it was yesterday and it was at the beginning, not in the meanwhile. Great, thank you. Um, Anna, how did, how did you find it? How did you live with this story? Um, well, for me, it was definitely um, a challenge. Right. Uh, when I when I received this book by the the editor at Lumen, she told me it's a pearl. I'm sending you a pearl by Edna O'Brien. I will never forget. Like, and I was like so happy. It was a Friday afternoon. I was like, okay, I'll start reading it now. I'll continue tomorrow. And then on Monday, I can tell something better. I started reading it, and I couldn't live it. You cannot live it like in the middle as if it was like, oh, okay, I end this chapter and I leave her there, lying in the mud. It's like you cannot do that. And so I had this, um, for a moment, I had like, I cannot translate this. I will be shocked. I will be, you know, I cannot. Then you get into this uh, and you think, as, as Catherine was saying, like, the girls inside this story are the ones who suffer most. Uh, then the author went there for a month, mingled among them. They, she wrote this book and I was like, Anna, you cannot say no just because you're, you know, like, so impressive uh, and so I well I, I I accepted the challenge and it was like a story that was with me not only um, while I was translating I understand what, what Giovanna says about the language and everything but the language is so for me it's so mingled it's so in between the story that I cannot uh, well it's really it's really strong novel although it's a short one it's really strong and for me it was like while I was um, translating when I was Sleeping while I so for some months this book was with me and I could not stop uh, speaking of the topic to to the people who were around me. So it's a it's one of these books that you cannot you know that well obviously they, they don't leave you yes as we were before which is also a, a gift in a sense. So then after a while I understood okay now I know why it's a pearl but it gets you know you you take a time to get there. So I'm really happy I could do it but it was a challenge. Thank you. And finally, um, Sabine, I wonder if um, Pierre Emmanuel and Lord had any comments on this um, on this question. 
Yes, I, I found the, these comments really interesting. And just uh, to say that as an, a publisher, as an editor, I had the same experience and, as Anna. I received the book on a Saturday morning and couldn't leave it. I was totally, I was shaking and I was totally in it. And so moved and, and also so proud to be able to carry this book to French readers, thanks to the trans translators. So uh, Pierre Emmanuel says uh, that a French psychoanalyst said that a translator must be endowed with an infinite capacity of sadness. A translator is an actor, as indeed Rose's paradox of the actor, hence the advantage of a two-person team. There are many tears, but the first to start crying would have awakened the other. Who could then take over? As poet Alfred de Musset said, the most desperate songs yield the greatest beauty, some so immortal they make me sob deeply. So the important thing is not the translator's sobs, says Pierre Emmanuel, of course, but their capacity to find the world to provoke in the reader what the poet Paul Celan calls larmes de voyance vive or tears of vivid vision. Thank you. A, a great, a great reflection to um, to conclude that question with. Um, I'm just going to ask James um, as we just passed the hour. James, do we have time to take um, another question? Yes, please do. Carry on. Okay, brilliant. We ha I have a question here um, about um, well, two questions which are similar. So um, somebody asking, could the translators tell us of a word or phrase that they were not entirely happy with, um, uh, you know, in the way that they translated it? Um, and somebody else asking if you could give an example of some of the hardest lines that you translated. So I wonder whether we might um, combine those questions, either a word or a phrase that wasn't quite satisfactory to you once you translated it, or something that was, was particularly difficult. Um, Giovanna, perhaps we could start with you. Are there any examples of, of, of difficult words or unsatisfactory words? Uh, the beginning. Uh... <laughs> and everything from there on. Um, prima ero ragazza, adesso non più, uh, is my Italian. Um, adesso is for now, uh, but we can say ora or adesso. I wanted to use ora because it's shorter, uh, but ora is like ero. I was. So they were too near. Um, and prima ero ragazza, ora non più, ero ora, uh, um, were cacophonic, so I couldn't use them. And uh, that was my first problem. And uh, th th that's the key of the, pro of the problem I had during uh, this translation. Um, uh, and, and the problem in general was to cut to the bone, to keep to, 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 yes, to cut to the bone. Like the surgeon O'Brien. Um, uh, Catherine, were there any particularly challenging or, or unsatisfactory words or phrases for you? Well, obviously, um, the first line uh, was, it was obvious that the first line is very, very important. And, um, I, I tried different variations, grammatical variations. Um, uh, the way it's in the book now um, is, ich war einmal ein Mädchen, aber ich bin es nicht mehr. I could have said, aber ich bin keines mehr, or I could, I could have chosen lots of different sort of slight variations and um, it took a lot of time for me to decide which which particular uh, well which which shape to give to the sentence because it, it's such an important sentence and I'm actually it took a it took a long time but I'm actually quite satisfied with it now because it has a sort of 
um, it's it's unusual and at the same time um, it's not too too strange so if I don't know that, that's really hard to explain because it, it's it's it has to do with the um, with the German language and and the the grammar and it's it's really hard to explain in a way what these little changes um, what they do what what kind of difference they make um, I I just uh, remembered another word that that I found really difficult to trans or to to choose a good German word for um, the buffoons that um, the two the two um, helpers at the military base um, I don't know if you remember them um, and of course um, there's a you can look up buffoon in every dictionary and you get different offers but none of them seemed really fitting and um, it took me a long time to find the word that seemed to fit best there so uh, that was I love uh, Looking in dictionaries and and uh, yeah, but I think the the one that I have now, Tölpel, is what I chose. Um, works okay. That struck me as an interesting word actually for for O'Brien to choose. Um, there definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, Anna, um, how about you? Any any particularly difficult or or, or unsatisfactory? Um, phrases or words? Uh, well, although it doesn't seem very original, I would say the first sentence is like a nightmare. And it was a double nightmare because when I said what happened, you will agree with me. Uh, I already talked about Chica, Nina, and so on, and why we were like thinking thoughtfully about that. Um, and also the ones, I was there once, right? So in the end, I chose, En otro tiempo fui una chica. Pero ya no lo soy, which I was quite satisfied with, and I was like, then I got it. And as I told you, La Chica is on the cover. Then we go to the back, back cover, and as you may know, sometimes like um, back cover texts go a different way, and sometimes their parts are not always uh, joined. And so the, the cover starts, Tiempo atrás fui una niña, pero ya no. Así empieza la nueva y sorprendente novela. So, they chose, they translated it differently, right? I love my editors. I know they do a perfectly fine job. But in this case, it was such a shame that they were not quoting what I actually put inside and what was in the title. So it was one of the things like, OK, I, I have been trying to find a good solution for this. Then I find it, but then we find a different thing, which doesn't mean it's not as good as it was. But, but it was both a challenge and a well, um, something complicated. Thank you, thank you. And um, Sabine, um, you may not have um, specific details, but um, do you yes. on? Yeah, you did great. great. Something. Um, for the first sentence, uh, more exactly the second. Uh, I was a girl once, uh, so in French it's j'étais une fille autrefois, c'est fini. But after, if, if uh, I remember well, Edna writes, I smell. And Pierre-Emmanuel and Aude translate, je pu. And this is very colloquial and very violent. As they could have said, um, je sens mauvais, but they write, je pu. And I, I remember I, I asked the question to them and they said, um, we can't imagine Edna wrote in a polite way because the text is very violent. And so, the, the, and, and, and Pierre Emmanuel is, uh, translates every time in a very literal way. He says that uh, the, 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 the choices has been done by the writers and so he really sticks to the English text. This is what I can say. That's great, thank you. And it's very interesting that you know to have this kind of concentration on the opening line, um, which is a is already I think an iconic line, um, even though it's a contemporary um, a contemporary novel. Um, we have a question here um, about the voice of the narrator. Um, did it take you long to to find the voice of the narrator? Um, Anna, um, do you have any any thoughts on this? 
Well, a little bit, it was uh, what Joanna was saying before. It, it was like uh, trying to convey uh, something that it was kind of simple because the main character obviously is a girl of 12, 14 when she's writing. So um, we, we don't need it to be like too elaborate. And it's really, it needs an impact. But at the same time, it's, um, well, it's not um, a poor language or anything like that. So maybe I, I needed some time to get into it, but I think it, it's so absorbent that once you get into it, I think it, it works. Because you don't have like, I, th I think it's more difficult when you have changes in different characters becoming the narrator or something like that, then you are in this schizophrenic mode. But once you get into into her voice, I think it's, uh, well, it, it works. Or at least the reader should, should say if it works, but it does for me. Yeah. It's really interesting the intensity of it is because it's just her voice but as you say you know she's a very young character as well to take that on is uh, must be difficult um Giovanna how about you how did you how did you kind of find her voice um uh I was lucky to to meet Edna while she was writing the book um she she received a, a, a prize in Italy the premio scanno given by the Fondazione Tanturri in Scanno, Abruzzo, and she was here in Italy and she was writing the book uh, and she wanted me to be there with her and uh, I talked uh, with her uh, about the book while she was writing it. And then she had an exchange of emails uh, about, uh, also about the book. Uh, so I was, I had time to, to, to get attuned uh, to, to that kind of book, to that kind of voice, to make research and so on. And then, as I said, it's uh, the, for the fourth book uh, I translate by her. So I felt a bit at home, uh, even if it's uh, a very uncomfortable home, that, uh, that book, because it's uh, very, very, very difficult. I think she is uh, Edna O'Brien at her best. Uh, it's really incredible. So. Uh, it, 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 it took time, uh, but I had uh, time I had before. <laughs> it was a privilege. Yeah, and I do think it is very interesting for people who are familiar with O'Brien's work, even thinking about the very early work with Country Girls and so forth, to hear this voice of another, um, of another young girl in a very different set of circumstances, but at the same time, um, I guess, covering um, comparable emotional terrain from time to time, the uncertainties of, of adolescence. Um, obviously writ large here, but um, Katrin, um, uh, the voice of the narrator. Um. Um, I can't really add much. My two colleagues said it all. <laughs> I think it's, uh, it's about finding the, the right balance between a language that's simple and uh, that could be the language of a 13-year-old girl. Um, and at the same time, it's not your regular sort of everyday um, teenage language, obviously. So um, it took a while to find the tone, but like my colleague said, the book is so strong that it's, uh, it sort of pulls you in and, and the voice just comes out. <laughs> so uh, the, yeah, I think, it, I think it worked fine. I mean, the book is so intense that you can't not speak with that voice. I think. And it is an interesting an interesting thing when reading it because there is such a kind of simplicity and economy with the prose style and yet it's very, very, um, very distinct. Um, and Sabine, I don't know if you have anything um, to add to this, this question. I think Pierre Emmanuel and Lord would, would, would have said the same as the, the three, three colleagues and I remember a conversation with Pierre Emmanuel telling me he was totally afraid because before beginning the translation, because he knew that this girl's voice, it's a girl's voice, and but it's also the voice of all the, the girls from Bring Back Our Girls. And, and so he had the, had the feeling that his responsibility was huge. This is what I could add. Again, really, really interesting. I mean, several of you have spoken about the extensive research that O'Brien carried out and remarkably, you know, went to northeastern Nigeria, was determined to meet girls who've been abducted in circumstances very similar to those that she describes in the novel. Um, and uh, and then as well, that 
responsibility of, of adopting this voice of um, of a girl who is representative and yet also who's, who's sharing an individual, a distinct um, story in the novel. Um, brilliant. Um, let's see, we have a good question here about the um, stylistic um, features of the novel again. Um, so the um, First of all, a good observation, which I'll just note, someone is reflecting that that page that we that we looked at, the Dawa page. Perhaps we ought to think more of that as an illustration than a, than a page of text. And I think that's a really good point. Um, the other thing is, uh, and someone's asking about this, um, in the English, uh, in the English edition of the novel, there are passages which are presented in italics when other characters give their own accounts of their own experiences. So they're narrating their own experiences to the um, to the to the main character and they're presented in italics. And we have a question here from somebody asking whether those italics were um, preserved uh, in the in the translated um, versions. Um, Sabine, could I start with you? Yes, sure. Uh, I, I will I will make the same answer. Saying that uh, Pierre Emmanuel is very literalist. And so, of course, we kept the italics for the other characters' uh, stories. Yes. Um, Catherine, did, was was it the same for you? Yes, absolutely. There's no way we could have changed that. That's part of the novel, and it has to be kept. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, and Anna, was it the same for you as well? Um, yes, we, we kept the uh, italic, but I will, which is straightforward, but I will just use my tar to, to add something I wanted to say uh, when they were asking, because when they ask like difficult words or things, you know, it's really hard to think of something you translated a year and a half ago. But then I thought another topic related to that is um, superstition. Superstition is really into the book as well. Yeah. And one of the yeah. words related to it was she, when they're talking about the literary girl and she said she's tainted, she's got blood, bad blood, right? And this tainted in the sense of she's uh, like, well, she's not clean, right? Uh, I translated, está contaminada, right? Which is quite, a, well, maybe it's a stronger word or something, but we also use it for blood sometimes. And I thought it was like a difficult word to, to translate because it was in a dialogue. And then I thought of this topic, superstition, and, and which is also quite into the into the novel, I think. Yeah, very much so. And um, in different, even in different kind of examples within the novel. Um, yeah. Um, and Giovanna, finally, um, the italics and the other um, the other accounts that come into the novel. Yes, we kept them. Uh, we we just. I say we, but it was the publisher just changing the, uh, the quotations uh, from the Bible and uh, from Dickens. Uh, it was the, it is in a, in a smaller character, in a smaller um, how do you say <laughs> a smaller uh, font. Kind of font size, yeah. Okay, a sign. Uh, but for the rest, the 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 rest remains in italics. Thank you very, very much. Well, uh, the chat is absolutely alive with people um, thanking you for a brilliant session and for, for, the, for the great conversation. Um, and I think it very much um, uh, takes us back to what Edna O'Brien said um, uh, for us in her video about the, about the nobility of translation, translation and the creativity of it, but also the special affinity between the, the translation, the, the translator and the writer. Um, and you've all demonstrated that brilliantly for us and opened this uh, extraordinary novel up um, in many, many more ways. So. Huge thanks to, um, to all of you um, for, for a really, really great uh, discussion. And I'll hand back now to, to Jane. Thank you, Rosie. Thanks so much. Uh, you've chaired beautifully. And thanks to everyone in the chat box, as you say, for, for um, giving us such interesting questions. Uh, thank you to Anna, Giovanna, uh, Catherine, uh, Sabine, and of course, uh, our partners at UNIC, especially uh, the uh, our partners at the French Embassy who have uh, facilitated this event so nicely and thank you to Danielle and Etna who've helped us to to organize it from this side and um, so um, that's that's us for this for this event we will have more uh, of this kind so if you if you enjoyed this event please do keep an eye on our web page and uh,
especially because you can now become a friend of the uh, Trinity Center for Literary and Cultural Translation, which means that you get uh, to know about these kind of events first. And there's a whole uh, load of other um, perks associated with that. So please do check our website. Um, just Google Trinity Center for Literary and Cultural Translation and you'll definitely find us. Uh, and that being said, I will look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.